Hey everybody, welcome to What the Flick. Continuing on with our coverage of The Night of Tim Alonzo, Episode 3, A Dark Crate. Uh, yeah, so the Khan family are all doing a lot of negotiation this week with no cards to hold, basically. Uh, you've got Nas behind bars, um, dealing with the sort of, you know, cell block power broker. You've got his parents uh, talking first to, to, to John Stone and then later to... Uh, Allison Crow. Allison Crow, Gloria Allred. Right. right? Can we agree? It's Gloria Allred, uh, played by uh, Glenn Headley, um, and yeah, and and so it, it it's sort of these these this whole deal making where they are not in a position to negotiate. They they don't really have a lot of options, and nonetheless, sort of trying to figure out like what makes sense, what's what's going to bite them in the ass the least, you know, at the end of all this. And Stone's sort of in the same position. He goes to see the ADA at the beginning of the episode, mm -hmm. asking, you know, what she had, how they can deal, try down to manslaughter. Yeah, he's already he's, on the he's, he's already on the plea, to plea track. right yeah. away. So everything that Alan has said, uh, Allison has said about him is right. Yeah, he's a plea lawyer. He's, he's Robert not a Shapiro. Lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> so I. And all he gets is here's, here's the name of a good tailor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I get that it fleshes out the world and that this was our. Stone episode. I'm uh -huh. done with the feet thing. Like, it, they are dwelling on it quite a bit, and I, I'm starting to wonder. When like, you have two application scenes and like a self help group. Yeah, meeting the scenes, eczema group. Like, yeah, it's uh. like they, 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 this had really better pay off as a metaphor <laughs> yeah. or something because yeah, otherwise you're right. They're spending a lot of time on this. Um, yeah, I, I uh, there was the, the the whole thing about the cab. I thought was fascinating. Oh like, yeah, I didn't even it. think well, about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I at some point I thought, oh well, you know, they search for evidence and then they, then it comes out of the impound. Nope, <laughs> not the case. And that's livelihood of three different people. Yes, and I'm sure that happens in real life all the time. Right. Well, you know, and and you see those, you you hear those internet stories about like some some terrible thing happens and then the the person has to like sue one of the victims and everybody gets all mad about it but they, they usually they, they have to because the insurance company makes them because that's the process of how these things work and so it's like i'm sure that papa Khan's, you know two partners don't want to throw a grand theft auto charge at naz on top of everything else but they may have to just to go through the process of getting the damn car back yeah um i mean between that and like needing to pay at least fifty to hundred and fifty thousand dollars just to prove that you didn't commit a crime. Right. Like life is super not fair <laughs> for everyone on this show. And yeah. like that feels so real and so heart wrenching to me. Right. Well I think, you know, a lot of times we get shows that are where you know, you see this in TV and movies all the time where, like, it's about a long-distance couple and they're, like, constantly on planes or people have to get a lawyer or whatever, and no one ever talks about how much all this shit costs. Yeah. You know, and these are all characters where they are very cognizant of how much this stuff costs, and, and that's as dramatic as anything else. You know? Like, lose your house, ruin your life, no more livelihood, don't go to college type ruin Exactly. Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we, a little of that came up uh, even on, on Outcast this week. Um so yeah, so so it's, it's I think being very smart about those issues and, and addressing that they exist, um, and then we also see Stone kind of sleuthing a bit, where he starts investigating the murder scene and discovers the back door. So I don't know if that's going to wind up being. You just, think the cat did it? I think the, the cat did. Ca it. Cats are, man, Can't they'll, trust them. they'll do you. No, you, you know that that Triumph the Insult comic dog song. Cats are cunts. <laughs> um, no, I don't think the cat did it. But I think that. But obviously, there was a there was a way for somebody to get in and out of the building that may or may not wind up being a red herring. But at least it's a it's a thing that, that the cops don't seem to have caught on to yet. Or if they are, they're not talking about it because they want to <laughs> make this thing happen as quickly as possible. Uh, great scene with Box and the and the uh, yeah, his uh, only scene really. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But uh, believe me, I'm sure we're getting more of him later. But uh, yeah, with the with the cops who wrote the report and <laughs> and and okay. See now the the puking guy that was a good payoff. Yeah, you're right. Because that was a joke that came up a couple times. I was like, yeah, but now that we got resolution to the puke, so maybe we'll also get eczema resolution. Okay. Yeah, well. I used to play bass for eczema resolution. But <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, guy, but you know, the, the, the bench keeps getting deeper. I love Glenn Headley. It's, it, it's great to see her, uh, uh, playing the lawyer. That whole monologue she gets about the, the, the stewardess's plastic surgery was really great. Um, 
And, uh, yeah, so. We get the scenes that show Stone cares mm -hmm. and that he doesn't believe Nas did it. Right. But I don't see any real practical reason to ever pay the money for Stone and, like, not go with Alison Crow in this trial, right? No, I, I just don't. I don't because he is a plea lawyer. As as presented on the show, that that's what I think. Of the the show, uh, other shows would would somehow stack the deck to where we go with the kind of plucky, you know, yep. idealistic guy and not the big slick corporate lawyer. But yeah, as it's presented, I, you would go with the slick corporate lawyer in a heartbeat. In a second, better lawyer, better, better resources, lawyer. no cost. Yeah, she's she, she's doing it pro bono. She's obviously a big deal, you know, like, uh, yes, in a, in, no, yeah, no question at all. So now I think because we know that John Turturro is, doesn't just disappear after this episode, it's uh, the onus is on him to prove why he needs to be involved, even if he winds up being on the team, you know, like if, if you know, he becomes, he makes himself indispensable enough that that Gloria Allred has to make him, you know, part of, like she'll pick up the tab for him to make him part of the team, you know, mm. whatever. Uh, yeah, it's very people versus OJ, this whole uh, legal. It's a little uh, bit better call Saul, too. Well, that, well, yeah, we're definitely we're, we're on that level of the, you know, the, the playing field of, of who the clients are. Um, but yeah, again, like the really small details about things. I like how the prison stuff is all very kind of threatening and unsettling, but not in a heavy-handed way. Like it's more about what might happen and, and what's about to happen, but they don't, it's not this constant barrage of like horrors, uh, which is scarier, you know, because you don't know when the breaking point occurs, like when, uh, when are they going to turn on him, you know? When are they going to set his bed on fire, you know, so. Yeah, I like, I've never been to prison. I don't know if you can tell that just by looking at me. Mm -hmm. But I don't, <laughs> it always weirds me out how much prisoners can, are portrayed that they can get away with mm -hmm. in jail with little to no repercussions. Like threatening to kill someone, lighting someone's bed on fire, all sorts of stuff in Orange is the New Black, where you would think the guards would just step in and say, oh, okay, well, I got to keep you from killing you, so I will separate you now. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I watched that, that uh, 60 Days In, that A&E show that was, it was trying to be a documentary about prison conditions, but really just wound up just being kind of a cheeseball reality show. Yeah. But there's a whole thing about sneaking cell phones into prison and how, like, that's those are super forbidden because that's how people have their contacts in the outside, blah, blah, blah. And the dude in power in here is obviously so powerful that he's got, like, nine cell phones, you know. And as he, he has that great monologue about how, like, we grew up in the same neighborhoods with the guards and, you know, we look out for each other and da-da-da. So he obviously has a whole kind of fiefdom going. And had... Naz immediately agreed to let this guy be his protector, that bed would not have caught on fire. Probably not. You know, Although I assume he's provided with a new non-on-fire bed. Uh, well, that's that's neither here nor there, but I'm just saying, like, the, you know, the, the, the stuff that happens or doesn't happen, there are a few individuals who have the juice to kind of control those things. So I guess no matter what the cost of protection is, it's worth it if everybody else is, wants to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> well, again, it's sort of like the, no matter what the cost of John Turturro, if John Stone is, if you think that's your best bet as a lawyer, that's better than having some harried, overworked, you know, public defender guy. Obviously, even better than that is having high-powered shark come in to do it for free. But, you know, right. it, it's all a matter of levels. <laughs> so we don't know much about... Um... God, I, all I can call him is Omar. But <laughs> did we know? Do we know his character's name? Uh, oh God, I know they say it at some point. Maybe we could Michael scroll, K. Michael scroll. K. Williams. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so he gives that great monologue about veal. And, yes. You know, being in a dark crate and you know just living to die, and that's right. that's the heavy-handed prison analogy. But it works. And sure. Yeah. I mean, Na really yeah, well. Nas is super out of his element here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and uh, the. The protection, whatever costs, I sort of read it to be a protection racket. Like, well, I'll have my guys come threaten you, and then you pay me to protect you from them. Right. Well, it's funny because, like, Nas didn't even negotiate in terms of, like, and what would you want in return <laughs> right. for this? You know, because that's sort of the unspoken thing hanging over this whole conversation. Um, and, yeah, no, it may well be a racket that, that it's not so much that those people are out to get him as much as those people will be out to get him because he's he not. Didn't pay. He didn't subscribe to the service. You right. Know? Uh, so, yeah, all of those things are possible. Uh, but I think also the stuff that he said about the Nation of Islam and the, you know, 
the, the how people feel about his crime might be true, although, again, all I know about prison is, you know, movies and TV. I always thought that they pretty much only went after you if you were like a child murderer, you know. Yeah. And and that actually got brought up on uh, preacher, preacher too. yes, yeah. it all ties together. So blending, um, <laughs> but but this isn't even prison. This is jail, right? This is well, it's Rikers. Yeah, I okay. mean it's it's pretty. Oh, no, I'm not saying the Rikers is a walk in the park. Sure, this yeah, no, you're right. This, this is, is all people. Hard time. This, this is, is waiting people for waiting trial. for trial. You're right. Yeah, so you it wouldn't is, think it that it would jail. get quite there so quickly, and you wouldn't think that you'd have a long-term person in there running the show. Uh, and, unless it's doing double duty, is, is Rikers a prison and a jail? A, I don't know. I'm sure the uh, commenters will tell us. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, or, you know, or who knows? Maybe, maybe uh, you know, he gets conjugal visits. He has like a yes. lot of control in there. Maybe that's you know, he's paying people's rent. New York yeah. is where he'd rather stay. You know, uh, or yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's any number of possibilities on how that plays out, but. Dramatically, I'd say it works for our, our purposes here. I love the whole thing of, I can't leave until you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Let me leave you with one last piece of advice. I don't have one. <laughs> and I also, I speaking of good uh, Totoro scenes, I also really like the one of him in the corporate lawyer office mm. talking to Chandra. Yes. Um, that was, I mean, he, he knows what's up. He knows how the game is played, even sure. though he doesn't get a chance to play it very often. True. Uh, yeah, uh, and and that was that's a that's a tricky scene I think for a white guy to pull off, but you know I think he's basically trying to tell he's trying to he, he's trying to sort of appeal to her sense of being valued as somebody not just for her ethnicity. You and know? she's being exploited, and yeah, it's obvious. Basically, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I you know this is just. So, uh, this is extraordinary television. I it mean, is. Steven Zellian is such a such a uh, talented director, and and Richard Price really knows his like sort of seedy New York so well. You know, um, yeah. I'm I'm just uh, and again, you know, the other thing we we were talking on Facebook Live about how you know there's so much great TV right now, and no wonder people aren't going to the movies as much. And I think also you're seeing that. Uh, shows like the HBO shows and the, 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 and the, the Netflix shows especially are really kind of playing around with the notion of what, what we'll accept as a narrative. You know, when you have like Stranger Things as something that people will just kind of watch as an eight hour movie practically, you know, or, you know, with, with, with a few, you know, meal breaks or whatever. And, and then you have this that, that is this, essentially also like kind of, it's a mini series, but it's, you know, we tend to think of the miniseries for so long as being these sort of sweeping historical things, and sometimes it's just a really intimate story that needs nine hours to tell, you know? It's weird that that's okay now. Mm. Like, if you had a nine-hour story to tell, then you had a shit story and you needed to cut it down to two hours. <laughs> like, like send that through some oh, rewrites, Believe dude. me, no, I see plenty of, of two-hour movies that should be 85 minutes. Agreed. But uh, sometimes I see a 105-minute movie that needs to be, you know, 300 uh, minutes, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but and, and I, I like that that flexibility exists, that you realize what it is you've got and how you're going to tell it, you know. What I would love to see is, if now that we've embraced bigger and longer, if we could have a way to have a movie be 65 minutes long and be okay with that. Because I think there are certain movies that would benefit from really just being kind of expanded shorts, and that's really what they've got to tell. Uh, but, you know. Or let's go back to embracing the 90-minute benchmark. Yeah. <laughs> you, could, you could be in and around 90 minutes, and that's fine. That's the average person's attention sure. span. Sure, and, and, the theater, and a lot of movies do that. But even a movie, sometimes you see an 85-minute movie that really needed to be a 55-minute movie. Uh, but again, I, I, at least we're, we're allowing this sort of this broader landscape, this bigger canvas. And, and certainly with the HBO stuff, I mean, did you watch Show Me a Hero? No. Oh my God. Totally ripped off by the Emmys. I know we talked about this. But that was a show where you really needed to get to know all of these different characters that operated in different levels of the story and, and, and were impacted by the events of the plot in different ways. And this one, you know, it's kind of the same thing where you could tell this story purely through like Nas's POV, but it's so much richer to have all these other perspectives than, you know, Box and Stone and the parents and, you know, all these other people involved. 
Um, so yeah, uh, this is this is great television. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one because so far all three episodes have felt very different mm -hmm. from the murder episode to the investigation episode to the prison episode. True. Like thematically and tonally very, very different each one. So I don't know whether we'll revisit any or the each will be different. Yeah, you know, you're right. Each one kind of is about that thing that it's about and allows itself that that hour to kind of dig deeply into it. So without necessarily moving forward a lot, it's taking it's it's making sure that each step gets fully explored from from all these different perspectives. So wherever they go next week, we'll be there. We hope you will too.